All right, that's my cue. How you doing, Victorville? Yes. All right, we're glad you're here. We're glad to uh, also welcome our other campuses. I, I'm going to introduce uh, some special guests in a minute, but before we do, I want all of our campuses to take note of something, uh, a special thing that we're doing in the next, uh, well, in the next series. Our Christmas celebration here at HTC begins on Thanksgiving weekend, and you'll be recovering from Thanksgiving, uh, celebrating Thanksgiving on Thursday, but we're going to gear up again like right away. We're starting our Christmas series on the greatest story ever told that weekend. And what we want you to do is uh, maybe a little extra than what we've asked uh, of you to consider in the past. Christmas Eve's a big deal at HTC, and you've all been real good about extending an invitation to people in your Oikos. Um, leveraging that Christmas celebration opportunity for uh, the Christmas Eve services. But we want you to bring that uh, same energy to that first, um, that first weekend of the series, November 30 and December 1st. On your welcome form, maybe you noticed it. Uh, probably not, but maybe you did. Uh, there is a special place to give us one name. That person that God has relentlessly brought to mind this year for you, who needs Christ. And uh, we want you to think about the possibility of inviting them to church that weekend. All of our campuses are going to be doing some special things, make it extra fun. We try to have fun all the time, but uh, going to try to make it extra fun that weekend. And the message that I'm going to share is going to be about uh, conflict in family and around the holidays. I think it will be applicable for everyone, believer and non-believer alike, but we're going to point them toward Christ and certainly the message of Christmas. So uh, we want you to give us that name. We pray every morning as a team, and you know this, we've told you this before, but we're going to pray for that name. The first name's fine. I mean, you know who that person is. I'm pretty sure God does. And, and we don't have to know the whole bio, just give us a name, and we're going to pray that when you invite, they will accept that invitation. That's the first uh, weekend, really in December, because the Sunday of that weekend is December 1, but obviously the Saturday is not in December yet, so just two days after Thanksgiving. Okay. Okay? Okay. How many of you understood what I said? Great. All right. Well, then we'll expect a good response. Uh, today, it is my privilege to introduce a couple of special guests, actually. Dr. Uh, Eric Tonis is a pastor. He's also the professor and chair of theology at Biola University. He and his daughter, uh, Paige, are with us today. Uh, they have, uh, Eric and his wife have four children, and Paige is uh, one of those very delightful young people. And so we've been blessed to have him here this weekend. Biola University is real important to the Mercer family, and if you're new and you don't know who I am, I'm Mercer, and our family has been very blessed for generations by the ministry of Biola University. My parents met there. They got married there. I'm an alumnus of Biola. Cheryl and I have three children, and two of the three are graduates of Biola. In fact, the two who went to Biola um, had Dr. Tanis for uh, Bible classes, and they were both pretty impressed that uh, he was going to be our guest and help us uh, push the ball down the field on the Sermon on the Mount. So I just want to say welcome uh, to Eric and Paige, and Eric is going to come share now. We want you, all of our campuses, all of you to give him and them a very warm, high a church welcome. Uh, welcome to Paige's father, Eric Thomas. Go get him. Thank you, Tom. So good to be with you all. I love this church and have been an admirer of the ministry here for a while now, and I'm thankful that we get to be part of it for this morning. And I, sometimes when you're part of a church, like you're part of a family in general, you don't realize how special it is because you're part of it. But as someone who is looking in from the outside, not part of this church family, I want you to realize how special this place is. Obviously, I don't know it deeply, but I know it enough to realize that this is an incredibly fruitful and influential and God-honoring church in many ways. And I've been so impressed by the leaders I've met at HTC because 
there's a humility. It's very hard for a ministry of this size and this influence to not become all about the dude. And, this, this, and people come for this person or even for the ministry. It's hard for a ministry to be influential and fruitful and still have it be about the dude, Jesus, who it needs to be about and advancing God's kingdom. And so I have seen at HCC a beautiful humility among the leaders and, and beautiful fruitfulness in ways that have been so helpful to me. I've been bragging about you guys for a while now since... I got to know some of the leaders. So I'm grateful to be here. I wanted to show you a picture of some of the people from my church where I'm one of the pastors, Grace Evangelical Free. This is just a few of the folks that work at our food bank on Friday afternoons, and they feed a whole bunch of people, as I know you do as well. And I wanted to show you a glimpse of my church family because I'm not just a talking head who's here to preach. I'm a pastor. I'm a member first of Grace EV Free, and... These are just a few of our folks. These are the people who take care of my wife and kids if I died today. And so they mean a lot to me. And I'm here under their authority with their blessing and their prayer this morning as they know I'm here preaching the word to you. So I'm thankful for them. And here's a picture of my family that I live with on a daily basis. That's my beautiful, brilliant, kind, gentle, good, patient wife, Donna who I've been married to for 30 years, yes. And we, yes, 30 years. And we met in high school when I was a complete idiot and she still was willing to date me. I had to wait around for her to break up with her boyfriend, but when she did, I moved in like El Nino and uh, never let up since. So Don is an incredible, incredible woman. I'm so grateful for her. To your left is my daughter, Caroline, who's 19. 11 years ago, we started adopting children, and we adopted three from Taiwan. Caroline, who is a natural-born leader, just, just oozes from her, and I just love my daughter, Caroline. My daughter, Paige, is in the middle. She's actually here. There's Paige. Paige, stand up and wave so they can see. Yay. See, we didn't... We didn't Photoshop that beauty into her. It's right there in the flesh. You could see it. Paige is incredibly servant-hearted. She has a heart for those on the margins and is just a, a diligent servant. Her name means, Paige, an attendant to a Lord. So someone waiting for the command from the Lord. And Paige is living up to that name, which is beautiful. The taller of the two boys is my boy, Sam, who is 14 and has the most tender heart. If he just sees a dog limping, he'll, tears will just come down his face. He's so sweet. And these days he's very impressed with his abs. <laughs> I'm trying to keep him humble. They are impressive. I'm not going to minimize that. But um, he's, he's really into working out basketball. He's, he's a great kid. And then the younger of the two boys is my boy, Isaac. First kids were from Taiwan. Isaac is from China, so we've got a little geopolitical conflict in our own home right there. Right there. He's quite proud of being the Chinese kid in the family. And he is the life of the party. He's never met a stranger. And he's, he's just an incredibly joyful kid. So that's my family. I wanted you to see these pictures of my two families here because I want you to know that what we're learning today from the Bible is something I'm learning right along with you. I am learning all the time of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ faithfully. And so as I prepare a message like today and preach it, I'm right in there with you learning to do this as a disciple of Jesus, as a husband, a father, a neighbor, as well as a member of my church and a pastor and a theology prof, yes, but, but I'm, I'm wanting to learn about what God has for us right along with you. Now... This morning, that's particularly true because we're learning from the words of Jesus in Matthew 7 as the series through the Sermon on the Mount continues. This morning, we're learning about prayer. And I want to start with just an honest confession. Prayer is incredibly difficult for me. I think it is for most people. But when I look at my life, I've been walking with Jesus as long as I can remember since I was a little kid. And 
I've grown in significant ways that I could tell you about. Even my wife will vouch for me. I've grown in some ways in these years. But sometimes I wonder if I've grown at all in my prayer life. Oh, I pray. And I, I have a life that is devoted to prayer. But so often, it just is work and takes discipline. And I'm so often distracted and frail and struggling and I am so glad no one has ever recorded my private prayers and then played them publicly. Because you would all say, why do you keep repeating yourself? And that, that is an incoherent sentence. That makes absolutely no sense. And what was that 15 minutes of silence right there? Were you meditating on the greatness of God? Nope, fell asleep. <laughs> Just dozed off. That's not uncommon, people. I, w I remember I was really feeling guilty about how often I would fall asleep while I was praying. And I told my friend, Michael, about this. And he said, Eric, why would you be guilty about falling asleep when you pray? And I said, well, it just feels disrespectful. If I were in the presence of a king, I would just doze off. And he said, Eric, do you think an old dog feels guilty when he falls asleep at the feet of his master? I like that interpretation of my sleep. But there's truth to that. And I, I want us this morning to be encouraged by the words of Jesus in our prayer lives. But I want it to be realistic. Because God is not surprised by our frailty. He's not surprised by the struggle that our lives are to be prayerful people. So what we're after this morning is setting some pretty lofty goals from the New Testament about what it means to be prayerful people, but in the midst of the daily grind of life that can be such a challenge to pull that off. And so let's go to the words of Jesus and find out what he has to say to us this morning in Matthew chapter 7 as we continue this series through the most famous sermon ever preached. Sermon on the Mount is undeniably the most famous sermon ever preached. Even people who don't know the Bible at all They'll know quotes from the Sermon on the Mount. All over the world, people know this sermon. It's amazing to be able to have it in front of us and study it and just do a few verses of that this morning. But listen to the words of Jesus as he continues to teach in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning at Matthew 7, verse 7. If you have your Bibles, that's where you are. Otherwise, it'll be on the screen. Let me pray as we go to the Word. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that the spirit who inspired your word is here this morning to open our minds and soften our hearts and change us through your word. And we pray that's exactly what he would be doing, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 7, verse 7. Jesus says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find, knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus is saying, go to God. And he's using these three kinds of access Access you get through seeking and finding. Access you get through asking and being informed as you need to be. And access by knocking on the door and it being open to you. I don't think these are technical ways of different sorts of prayers, for instance. I just think Jesus is giving us these verbs to encourage us to believe that we have uninhibited access to God. In prayer, we're able to go to him with everything. And whatever obstacles you perceive are between you and God, obstacles of uncertainty if you'll get an answer when you ask, obstacles of uncertainty if you seek that you'll actually find, obstacles of uncertainty about knocking and finding a closed door. He's saying, no, no. If you know the character of the God to whom you're praying, you won't believe those obstacles are in the way. He loves to hear dependent, eager prayers of his people. In other words, Jesus says, go to God with everything and never doubt that he will be there for you listening. 
perfectly and attentively and compassionately and extravagantly providing for you in all of the requests you have for him. And so he says, go for it. Go to God. Go to him. And then he contrasts human fathers with our heavenly father. Verse 9. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or ask for a fish and you give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, <laughs> know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask them? So he's contrasting human fathers here. He's talking to his disciples, but he's talking to all of us saying, look, fathers, although they can be all kinds of different fathers, fathers, generally speaking, they want what's good for their kids. If their kids come and ask for a fish, you're not going to say, here's a serpent sandwich, son. Here you go. Now, there are really bad fathers who, who are evil, but he's saying, look, you who are evil... You want what's good for your kids, don't you? Well, if you do, and you're a sinful human being, how much does a holy, good, compassionate, perfect father want what's good for his kids? He's saying, you who are evil. Now, this is interesting. Jesus says to his disciples, you who are evil. Now, he's not singling out the disciples here as particularly evil fathers. He's saying, you're human. And Jesus is shooting straight with them about the human condition. That we do, we have sinful hearts. Man, if you don't believe humanity has a sin problem, you must not watch the news. Because we've got a sin problem. You, you must not look honestly in your own heart and realize, man, my, my heart is filled with rebellion against God and selfishness. We've got a serious sin problem. And Jesus is just acknowledging what the Bible teaches over and over again, that the human heart is deeply sin sick. And he's saying, and so human fathers who are sinful, they have their kids' best interest in mind. Wouldn't your heavenly father be the same in infinitely more so? And that, that's what he's trying to do is say, look, you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So ask him. So ask him, and the struggle of prayer is real. And Jesus is saying, don't let anything stand in the way. Don't let anything stand in the way. So three big points I want to get across this morning from this passage, these few verses. One, we realize when we understand this passage that the Christian life is characterized by persistent, expectant, dependent prayerfulness. This is this vital point, this first idea that prayerfulness marks the life of a Christian. Two, God loves to supply all our needs. And he most fully does this in his son, Jesus. God loves to supply our needs. And he does this most fully in Jesus. And then three, God is the perfect strong, compassionate, generous father that we all desperately need. The Christian life is characterized by prayerfulness. God loves to provide our needs and he's the perfect, strong, compassionate, generous father who does this for us. So first, the Christian life is characterized by persistent, expected, dependent prayerfulness. When we realize who God is, we start to go to him with everything. And we find a God who extravagantly, lavishly, generously is for us as his children. And this character of God drives us to be prayerful people. We believe God is a good father and we go to him with everything. We ask him for whatever our needs may be, and he delights to answers, answer those prayers. Now, I, I want to start off by correcting a way this passage has been used and others like it 
to actually teach the opposite of what we need to understand here. And that is, sometimes passages like this that says, go to God and he will answer your prayers. Sometimes these kinds of passages are used to actually fuel a very shallow, selfish, human-centered approach to this. You can call it the prosperity gospel. You can call it the name it and claim it gospel. You can call it the health wealth gospel. But there's a way of understanding passages like this when they're pulled out of a biblical context that actually end up teaching the opposite. So someone will read something like this and say, cool, God, Lamborghini, now. God, I'm going to ask her to go on a date. Make sure she says yes. Here we go. God, I'm sick. Make it go away. Now. Poof. God, I've got financial struggles. Will you make me rich? And we view God then as this blessing dispenser, this Santa Claus in the sky, this God who exists to meet my needs as I define my needs according to what I think I want and need in the moment. And as we'll see, that ends up being the opposite teaching. And so we need to develop a biblical understanding of prayer that doesn't lead to a shallow human materialistic self-centeredness, but to what prayer is biblically. And so we need to develop a theology of prayer, which means in the Bible, prayer is always God-centered. It's not God out here meeting the needs I perceive to have at the moment. It's God at the heart of my life, defining my needs from his perspective, and then going to God for him to meet those needs. So there's a God-centeredness to it. There's a gospel-groundedness to it. That means God meets our needs ultimately in his son, and so the good news of God for us in Christ becomes the heart of our prayer life. That means every time you pray, you're exercising the realities of the gospel, the good news of God for us by sending his son to take our place in his perfect life and perfect sacrifice and victorious resurrection, when we have a gospel groundedness to our prayer, every time you boldly approach the throne of grace in confidence, you do it because of Jesus. And you're glorifying Jesus, you're exalting Jesus because you know that you can only go into the presence of God like that because of Jesus. You know that all you should hear from God is depart from me. But because of Jesus, what you hear from God is come unto me. All you who labor and have you're laden, and I will find, you will find rest. You hear access, you hear welcome, you hear invitation from this God because of what Jesus has done for us. And so for the Christian, prayer is God-centered, it's gospel-grounded, and it's kingdom-advancing. It's saying, Lord, I have access to you. I want the people in my life, in in your oikos, to have access to you as well through Jesus. So use me in bringing them to you. I love the missions-mindedness of this church. I love this desire for each Christian to see themselves as ministers of the gospel, an evangelist that God intends to use powerfully in the lives of other people. And that needs to be grounded in prayer. Ian Bounds said, never go to men about God before you go to God about men. In other words, ground your efforts to reach people in your prayer on their behalf. That's how priests function. So a theology of prayer is God-centered, gospel-grounded, and kingdom advancing. Look at Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything. And boy, do we need to hear this. The more and more comfortable our lives become, the more and more convenient our lives become, the more and more secure our lives become, it almost seems like the more and more anxious we become. Anxiety is a a debilitating reality for so many of us. But here's God's word to us. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, everything, by prayer and supplication, asking God to meet our needs with Thanksgiving, with hearts of gratitude, let your requests be known to God. And here's the result. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Where? In Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Listen to Jesus in John 13. Whatever you ask in my name, 
this I will do. That, here's the, the ultimate goal of our prayer. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. To understand in my name means that you understand that when you say in Jesus' name, isn't it interesting? Most Christians end their prayers with, in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Barely thinking about what we're saying. I know I do that. In Jesus' name, amen. We, we can do, what did you just say? I said, in Jesus' name, so be it. Amen. Do you realize what you're saying when you say in Jesus' name, amen? In the Bible, to say in someone's name means according to who they are grounded in that person's character. So in other words, when you pray and then end it with, in the name of Jesus, you are saying, according to the power of Christ and the mercy of Christ and the love of Christ and the wisdom of Christ and the presence of Christ and the sovereignty of Christ, and according to who he is, I pray this. I don't say in Jesus' name is some magical incantation at the end of the prayer to somehow make it happen. No, I ground every prayer in who Jesus is, who he is and his ways. See, that's why the Lamborghini now idea. Now, if you have a Lamborghini, good on you. And that's a blessing from God. But what I'm saying is, is when you pray in Jesus' name, you're praying in a God-centered, gospel-grounded, kingdom-advancing way. And now it reorients your normal prayers. It's all reframed in light of who God is. And the goal is to glorify God. Listen to Jesus in John 16. In, in John 16, in that day, you'll ask nothing of me when he returns, because he'll bring everything we need when the kingdom comes. But then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, there it is again, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy will be full. Do you hear how Jesus keeps saying, according to who I am, do this. Be persistent. Keep going in my name. And knowing who Jesus is will fuel me in this. I've been so discouraged, as I've said, in my prayer life. And then I'll read these biographies of these great saints of old and how they would spend so much time in intense, fervent prayer. And Jesus, he would spend the whole night in prayer. And we're to be in constant prayer. And I would look at the reality of my life and I'd say, wow, my life seems completely different than that. And I remember hearing this Luther quote, Martin Luther, this great reformer who helped change the church and, and focus on the Bible and the gospel. I remember hearing Luther was asked, what are you doing today? And he said, oh, I have so much to do today. I must spend three hours in prayer. And I thought, three hours? Wow. When I have so much to do today, my first thought is I gotta get after it. And so I, I would contrast my life with those sorts of things and I would feel just so discouraged. But then I heard, it's probably, Martin Luther probably didn't even say that. Oh, but I know one thing he did say. Listen to what he says to his friend Melanchthon. He says, you extol me too much, Melanchthon. Your high opinion of me shames and tortures me since unfortunately I sit here like a fool and hardened in leisure, pray little. Do not sigh for the church of God. In short, I should be ardent in spirit, but I'm ardent in the flesh, in lust, laziness, leisure, and sleepiness. Already eight days have passed in which I've written nothing in which I've not prayed or studied. This is partly because of temptations of the flesh, partly because I'm tortured by other burdens. I thought, oh, that sounds like my life. I, I can relate to Luther now. Because it's a battle, people. It's a battle to be prayerful. It's a battle to go to him. But when I hear that God is a good father who's for my good, it shakes off the lethargy. It motivates me to pray like never before. And then I realize the second point here, God loves to supply all our needs. And he's done that in Jesus as we've been seeing. He loves to supply our needs. L listen to this amazing verse in Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? He's saying, God gives you his son. 
if he does that, why would you doubt him for anything else that's good? Anything else you need? He sent his own son. You can trust him through his son for eternal life. Well, then you can certainly trust him for daily life. You can certainly take everything to him. You can say, Father, the test results from the doctor are positive. I'm taking that to you. Father, I'm struggling in my marriage. I can take that to you. Father, I'm struggling to be a good mother or father. I can take that to you. Father, I'm struggling financially. Whatever it may be, we take it to him, believing that he's not cheap. You know, the first lie we were ever told about God, he's cheap. He's He's stingy. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. That's what Satan's told our foreparents, Adam and Eve, in the garden. So he can't eat of any tree, any fruit in the garden, huh? And Eve calls him on it and says, no, he can eat of everything. Just not that one tree. And he said, ha-ha, he's holding out on you. He doesn't have your best interest in mind. Better go fend for yourself. Don't trust him, trust yourself. And that's where everything went wrong and continues to go wrong we realize that God loves to extravagantly, generously, lavishly meet our needs and care for his people. God loves us. And the Sermon on the Mount shows us he loves us most foundationally in sending his son. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will never die but have eternal life. He's met our greatest needs in his son. And so that means the Sermon on the Mount doesn't just give us a morality or an ethic for living. It gives us an understanding of what kingdom people look like. And when you get to the end of the Sermon on the Mount and you read things like, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees and be perfect because your heavenly Father is perfect, when you read those statements, you should not say, got my marching orders. You should say, help, I can't do that. And then what do you do? You get to the end of yourself and you run to the feet of Jesus because he's the one who is holy and blameless. He's the one who obeys in the place of those who trust him. He's the one who paid the penalty for our sin perfectly. We go to Jesus and then we are empowered and freed to live as kingdom people and pray that God will make it on earth as it is in heaven. That's what he does. And so we've got to put God in our prayers. And we've got to put ourselves in our prayers. What do I mean by that? Sometimes this idea that I pray and God does it leads to a passive approach to the Christian life. And that's not true at all. When we pray, we say, Lord, would you give me grace and peace and life and godliness and fruitfulness According to your word, would you make these things real in my life? Open the eyes of my heart to be enlightened by you. Use me. Help me to be more like your son. Use me as an an instrument of your peace, as a minister of the gospel. And he loves those prayers. But then we don't just wait around for it to happen. We say, and Lord, what does it mean for me to actively put myself in my prayers too? Which means we, we... become more diligent than ever at finding who God is and who we are in his word and in prayer and in ministry and service and giving and missions and proclamation and suffering to the glory of God, all the things he calls us to as we avail ourselves to the means of grace he's given us to become the people he's called us to be. And put your body in your prayers. I find it so helpful to get on my knees when I pray, or to lie prostrate when I pray, or to cover my face or lift my hands in worship and in prayer. And please realize prayer is worship and worship is prayer. There's no line between the two. And so we devote ourselves to prayer and put ourselves in our prayers and God at the center of them. And we find that he indeed is a good, good father. He's a strong, perfect, compassionate father that we all desperately need. We all need a father to rescue us from this cold, dark world that we all live in. We need escape from the evil of this world. And God, as our heavenly father, always has what's best for his kids in mind that he's after. We don't just need ideas, do we? We We need a father. We don't just need facts. We need a father to help us. 
We need salvation from the darkness of this sinful world and our sinful selves. And God promises to be the strong, compassionate, attentive, wise Father we all desperately need. And our Heavenly Father is here for us. And maybe you had a bad earthly father. And it's hard for you to imagine anything good about a father. And I realize that's pretty common in our day. But please don't project your experience of a bad earthly father on your heavenly father because he's not bad. He's for you and he's with you and he's seeking your good when you have been made one with him in Christ. Listen to what he says in Psalm 103. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This father is intimate and powerful and provisional and caring and good and protective of his children. My parents were divorced when I was three. And my dad, for a period of my childhood, lived about 40 minutes from where my brother and I and my mom lived. And I was a pretty wild kid. My brother and I were both wild. We were feral children who sort of raised ourselves and... and um, my mom worked a night shift and then she'd sleep a good chunk of the day. So we just were unchaperoned for much of our time. And, and we were pretty wild. Like I, I went to the senior prom when I was a freshman. And so as a 14-year-old freshman, I just stole my mother's car and drove Tracy to the senior prom. Um, don't listen to that page and don't ever think of doing something like that. But one night... Uh, my mom was at work, and my brother and I uh, took the car, and it had been freezing rain where we were in Connecticut growing up for a couple of days, and, and then it got really cold. And so the parking lot up at the football field where my high school football field was, this big parking lot got flooded, and then it froze. So it was this giant sheet of ice, this giant, basically shallow pond in a parking lot. So my brother and I took my mom's car to Nolan Field parking lot and had the time of our lives. <laughs> Just, I mean, spinning five, eight times. It was unbelievable. Power sliding. Just, it was incredible. We were having the time of our lives until all four wheels went through the ice and the car just bottomed out and got completely stuck in the middle of this parking lot. Huge parking lot. And so we, we got to do something. So little brother gets out, and he's behind it trying to push the car as my brother's. And, and I'm getting splashed with cold ice and water. I'm soaking wet. I'm freezing. My brother's trying to push me. He's getting mad at me. Push harder. And it's just a nightmare. And it's after midnight, and we're stuck. And if my mother finds out, my life probably would have ended that day. And so we're desperate. And we said, what are we going to do? We're stuck here. Let's call dad. So my brother and I ran down the street. We found a payphone and we had enough change and we called him. For you young people, payphones are these things that. Anyway, um, and, I put, we put, and we said, Dad, we're in big trouble. We're stuck in the middle of Nolan Field parking lot. Can you please help us? We woke him up in the middle of the night and he said, I'll be right there. He must have really gone fast because he lived about 40 minutes away. He got there in about 20. And he pulls in. And he had this big Chevy Suburban. It was brown. And he pulls in and he says, boys, get in the Suburban. You look freezing. I've had the heat cranking. And I've got some blankets in there. And I brought a thermos of hot chocolate. I got this. And he did. He had this, this winch on the front of his Suburban. Now that's a cool dad, right? Winch, he's got this hook with this cable. And he put it on the car. And he pulls this thing out of the ice and he drags it to the street and we're saved. Oh, it was great. And my mother never found out. <laughs> she doesn't have a computer, so she probably will never even listen to this, so she still won't know. <laughs> now I think I have to tell her next time I go home, huh? Uh, but she never found out. And I gotta tell you, when I hear the word father or fatherhood, so often my mind goes back to that moment of dad pulling up in the Suburban and saying, I got this. 
My brother and I had absolutely no way to solve our drastic problem we had gotten ourselves into, but my dad had all the resources. He had the, the love and the willingness to get up in the middle of the night and get us out of this predicament we got ourselves into. And Jesus says, if you think earthly fathers, sinful fathers are good like that, what do you think your heavenly father's like? What do you think he's like? Oh, you can go to him. Trust me. And here's the amazing thing. When you turn from your sin and trust Jesus and saving faith, you're not only forgiven, you're declared righteous. And you're not just declared righteous, you're adopted into the family of God as a co-heir with Christ. When Jesus is baptized, it says during his baptism that the Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. He says the same thing when Jesus is transfigured in the face of his disciples. It says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm completely pleased with. What you need to realize is that when you trust Jesus, you are united with him by faith and he loves you the same way he loves Jesus the son, which is as much as he can If you're in Christ, God loves you as much as he can. He doesn't just kind of love you or sort of like you or is working on liking you. He loves you. He says, this is my beloved son and daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Please don't ever think God tolerates you. Please don't ever think he puts up with you because he's stuck with you. No, he knitted you together in your mother's womb. And when you're in Christ by faith alone, he loves you as much as he can. He's for you. He likes you. He's fond of you. He thinks your jokes are funny. (laughs) Well, at least most of them. He's for you. Believe that about God. He doesn't put up with you. You know what I find I do? Because, Because I so often love people Kind of. Because I'm so often on the process to loving them when I really don't want to or feel like it. I just assume that's how God feels about me. And I'll use expressions like, well, I have to love you, but I don't have to like you. And yes, sometimes that's part of the process and getting the true love. But what I can start thinking is that how, that's how God loves me. He loves me because he's stuck with me. He's committed to me because of his character. But if he could get out of this, he would. No, God loves us. My beloved son in whom I'm uh, well pleased. That's how we need to see God's love for us. In the sonship of the son, we have everything we need. Jesus is Emmanuel. Christ is God with us. He's our heavenly father, expressing his love for us through the son. And he cares for his people. Jesus is eternal and will never die. And here's the thing. Some of us had bad bad earthly fathers, and this makes it hard for us. Some of us had really good earthly fathers, and we may not know how much we need our heavenly father because we've had such a good earthly father. But even the best earthly father dies. Jesus is eternal. God is eternal. He'll never die. He'll always be there for you. And even the best earthly fathers are your heavenly father caring for you through them. And for those of us who don't have fathers, who have lost our fathers, or, or haven't seen our fathers, or have fathers who've completely dropped the ball, I exhort you to find fatherly care in the church. The the church should be our family. It should be the motherly, fatherly care we need. It should be the, the brotherly, sisterly care we need. That's where we're to find this. God cares for us through his people. He's our everlasting father. He's the tender strength that will never end. And in Christ, he teaches us to pray like he does. Our father who art in heaven. Listen to this amazing passage in Romans. So good. Listen. You did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that he may also be glorified with him. We may be glorified with him. 
And then listen to this precious ministry of the Spirit in our prayer lives. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do, do not know what we ought to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Is that great? So as we struggle in prayer, oh, I, I don't know about you, but I've been praying for some things in my life for 45 years. I don't know what to pray anymore. Lord, would you save him? Bless him so he'll serve you. Take everything so he'll serve you. Take my life if he'll serve you. And I run out of things, so eventually my prayers become help or ah. And what we're told here is the Spirit says, got it. I know exactly what you mean. I'll take that before the throne and make it intelligible and aligned with the will of God. The Spirit cares for us in this way out of hearts of children crying, Abba, Father. Oh, and listen to these words in 1 John 3. How great the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We're not orphans anymore. We're not insecure anymore. We're not lonely anymore. We don't fear anymore. We don't despair anymore, even though that can be the reality of our lives. When we go to God with everything, when we ask and see and knock, we find a good God who loves us. Adam is a failure father. Satan's the worst father you could ever have. Abraham, Father Abraham, had many sons, many sons. He's not the one I need. Your earthly father is not the one you ultimately need. Your heavenly father is. And we can go to him knowing he will always provide everything we need from him. My daughter, Caroline, we adopted her when she was eight. And... She only knew Mandarin Chinese. She knew shapes and colors and animals and numbers when she came in English, but otherwise it was Chinese. And, and we got her, brought her home from Taiwan, and she had been home about five days when we said, we're going to church. It's a place where we go worship God, and then we'll be back in three hours. And she got all dressed, she got all ready, and we thought we were all ready to go. My wife and I went out to the car, and she, she was nowhere to be found. We were, where is she? And we're waiting in the car for her. And time kept going by. And we're thinking, what is she doing? Now, it's interesting. Not much has changed in 11 years. <laughs> in that regard. But for very different reasons. But when she finally came out of the house, my little eight-year-old daughter walked out of the house. I will never forget this scene for the rest of my life. She came out of the house carrying everything she could. A change of clothes, food, her favorite stuffed animals, her favorite games. She was coming out to the car with everything she thinks she was going to need if we never came back. And we said, honey, we're coming back in three hours. You don't need any of that. It's okay. And she gave us a look I'll never forget. It basically said, I hear you, but I'm not taking any chances. And the next week, it was similar. And the next week, she had a little less. And over time, she ended up finally coming out with nothing because she believed us. She believed that we loved her and we were for her. And she didn't need to fend for herself anymore because she had a father and a mother who loved her. And I've thought of that scene of Caroline coming out of the house like that so many times because I think, Lord, how often do I walk around in my life carrying all these burdens, all these idols, all these sins that are exhausting me when you tell me you're a good father and I can trust you and I can leave them at your feet, coming to you knowing I will find the answers and the access and the provision I desperately need. Oh, we can go to him with everything. He's a good father who meets our needs. And so then our lives are marked with going to him with everything. You know, there's an old hymn that says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, as children of God by faith, let's go to him with everything in prayer. Everything, because he's a good father who loves to provide for his children. Heavenly Father, help us 
We need it. We are so easily distracted and discouraged and anxious and sinful. Help us, Lord, to get to the end of ourselves and run to you. Father, religion tells us, I've really messed up. Dad's gonna kill me. But the gospel tells us, I've really messed up. I need to call Dad. Lord, and we call on you, knowing you're a good father who loves his children and is for us and with us, working our good every day. Lord, I pray for these dear saints and ask that you would bless them and encourage them, grounding their lives in the gospel, depending on you as their good father, and being used by you in astounding ways in the lives of others. Bless this church. Bless the campuses of this church. I pray the impact it's having in this community would increase and advance in wonderful and astounding ways. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus.